So what I'm going to talk about is our opioid epidemic and um, kind of some, some policies that we have incorporated in the healthcare field to help battle this epidemic. And so, um, first of all, as a medical epidemiologist, I think I have to start out by kind of laying out what the epidemiology is, you know, how much we're seeing, who's at risk, because that's really what we have to base our evidence-based guidelines on. So I'm going to be doing that and then talk about some, some um, you know, policy and programmatic work that we've done in our opioid task force. So just for some um, national data, and these were just published by uh, CDC in the past month. So um, we know that in 2015, there were over 13 million people who used uh, opioids for non-medical reasons. And two and a half million of those are classified as having an opioid use disorder. We know that the, uh, the death rate from um, opioid overdoses has increased substantially in the past 15 years, you know, over 200%. And actually, right now, we are seeing more opioid-related overdose deaths and we did uh, deaths from AIDS during the peak of the AIDS epidemic. So this is really a truly a public health crisis. And this costs our healthcare systems a lot of money, you know, almost $80 billion a year. So uh, here's some more data that was published by CDC very recently, looking at the uh, number of um, overdoses and opioid overdoses in 2015 and comparing those data to just one year prior to that, 2014. So according to CDC, in 2015, um, just, uh, uh, there were about 52,000 drug overdose deaths in the United States, and two-thirds of those involved opioids. We know that the death rate from synthetic opioids, like fentanyl, and, and, um, increased by 72%, and then death rates uh, from heroin increased by 21%. And this actually touched every, all demographics, all areas in the United States, all race, ethnicity, Cities, all socioeconomic statuses. And in the, um, may you have, may have heard on the news that um, yesterday the county executive and uh, law enforcement and I went on the news just to warn the public about the, uh, about this. Um, we assume some really dangerous uh, pro you know, drug product out on the street because we had seven deaths in the past 24 hours. And, um, and again, only two of those were in the city of Buffalo. Everywhere else was from the suburbs, so nobody is immune. And just in New York State alone, um, from 2014 to compare to, uh, um, from 2015 to compare to 2014, in New York State, we saw 136% um, increase in, uh, in opioid-related deaths. So again, we are very affected in New York State and in Erie County, and I'll show you some data in Erie County just now. So. Um, this is, um, these are again the CDC data looking at the rates of drug overdose deaths involving heroin um, by age group uh, from 2006 to 2015. And you can see that the age group that is most effective are people in their 20s and 30s. And we're seeing the same thing in Erie County as I'll show you just now. And you know, that is so sad because you know, these are children, their siblings, um, their, their you know, partners, their husbands, wives, their parents. And they have their whole lives ahead of them, and it's ended by a preventable cause. So this is looking at the uh, percentage of drug overdose deaths in um, the United States in 2010 in dark blue, 2014 in light blue, and then compared to 2015 in green um, by specific drug category. So I just want to call your attention to heroin um, and synthetic opioids um, like fentanyl, and those have seen um, a huge increase, a really significant increase in their contribution to all drug overdose deaths in the United States over the past five years. So uh, this is a map using CDC data to see what country, areas of the countries are most affected. And the darker shaded areas correspond to the higher death rates from opioids. So you can see that um, Appalachia is very affected. Um, New England is very affected. The, the uh, Southwest is very affected. But um, when we kind of zoom in and look at New York State, you know, Erie County is also very affected. So let's talk about some Erie County data. So um, these are data that uh, were reported um, through, the, um, th through the end of, uh, of this month, but excluding the, um, you know, the, uh, the past 24 hours, unfortunately. So you can you know, tag on another 11 cases 
um, or the past 36 hours, you can tag on another 11 cases. Looking at our number of opioid-related deaths, both confirmed and suspected, from 2012 to 2017. So we really started to see a huge increase in 2015 where we doubled the number of deaths, opioid deaths, compared to 2014. In 2016, um, we're, even, we're also higher than uh, 2015, but you know, thank goodness we, we didn't double. And um, you know, we're uh, seeing, again, a lot of deaths in 2017. We, um, with, uh, both with some, um, we have 18 confirmed cases, and we probably have about 100 pending cases right now. So it's, it's, uh, it's very, very sad. So this is looking at the demographics of who's been affected by um, these opioid-related deaths. Um, and it's color-coded in gender. The pink corresponds to females. The blue corresponds to males. And looking at data from 2014 to 2016. So you can see that just in terms of deaths, um, males are, are more affected. It's only oh, almost 80% of opioid deaths are among males. And then this is looking at our opioid-related deaths in Erie County from 2014 to 2016 by uh, race, ethnicity. And so you can see that white uh, corresponds to, um, white race, ethnicity corresponds to the blue color. And you can see that, you know, whites are our most effective in terms of opioid-related deaths. So this is looking at the ages of uh, our victims of our opioid-related deaths of confirmed cases in Erie County in 2015 in uh, in blue or uh, aqua, and 2016 in green. So you can see that you know we have span all ages from you know under 20 adolescents to over 60. We've had unfortunately deaths of people in their 80s. So, um, but you know the peak ages we're seeing uh, most affected is people in their 20s and 30s. And so again, this is very sad because these are preventable and they have their whole lives ahead of them. You know, their children, their parents. Um, their siblings or best friends, and it's very, very sad. So this is comparing our, uh, our Erie County census data in the table compared to our uh, opioid overdose demographics in the red on the right. So, um, so you could just, we could just see where the health disparities are and which populations are most affected. So you can see that uh, in Erie County, about 80% of our population is classified as white, and about 80% of our opioid death victims are classified as white. Um, with our uh, population, it's about 50-50 gender, um, female, male, though a little bit more females, but almost 80% of our opioid overdose death victims are male. So again, there's a disparity by gender. And then again, looking at age, about 25% um, of our Erie County population is in their 20s and 30s, but almost 60% of their opioid death victims are in their 20s and 30s. So again, there's an age disparity there. So that's, you know, to think, looking at these demographics to figure out, you know, where we need to cart target, where we need to focus our resources. So this is looking at um, where our overdose death victims lived. And so you can see in, in Erie County, so you can see that, you know, although 44% of, um, of their overdose death victims lived in the city of Buffalo, um, still, you know, just as um, almost a high, as high percentage lived in the suburbs. And if you're familiar with Erie County geography, it's all over the place, the first ring suburbs, the second ring suburbs, and then also in the rural area. So there is no place that is safe, it's just in terms of the exposure to, to risk. And this is looking at our um, opioid-related deaths in Erie County in 2015 on the left and 2016 on the right, looking at uh, type of opioid. So we're here, we're specifically, I'm reporting data looking at heroin, fentanyl, combination of heroin, fentanyl, and other opioids. So you can see that where we are trending is, is more deaths being caused to fentanyl. So, you know, fentanyl is a very, very, very potent narcotic pain medication, but it's also being uh, used to, uh, to spike um, the heroin. Just a few grains can cause people to overdose and die, 
or you know people are just you know seeking just straight fentanyl to get that great high. Um, but unfortunately, it it uh, it works very very quickly, and and people va die just in you know, moments after they uh, somehow ho however they they take them the uh, the fentanyl. So and and when our um, our medical examiners, uh, scene investigators, you know, tell us that um, they find victims with needles still in their arms or naloxone in the same room, but they just didn't have time to get to it. So it's very, very sad. So other health consequences, um, you know, death, I mean, death is um, is a major consequence, but there's also some, you know, chronic diseases that we have to worry about with uh, hepatitis C and neonatal abstinence syndrome. So um, these are data looking at confirmed cases of chronic hepatitis C by age group. So these people, you know, through laboratory data, we assume that they've been infected for at least a year. So, you know, we don't know how long they've been infected for at least a year. And I'm sure as nurses and people in the School of Nursing, um, we all know, you all know that in New York State, we're, you know, mandated to test all baby boomers for hep C at least once. So we see we're finding a lot in baby boomers. But we are finding a lot in people in their 20s. And again, we don't know how long they've been infected. And they, um, so this is really a problem that should be on the radar screen of um, healthcare providers that take care of young people, including adolescents. And so these are looking at our, uh, again, um, Erie County confirmed uh, cases of uh, chronic hepatitis C in blue and acute hepatitis C in red um, over time. And you can see that. Um, among people under the age of 30. So you can see this is a growing problem among people under the age of 30. And as you can see that the curve is very similar to the curve that we're seeing with our uh, opioid overdose deaths. And then this is looking at the percent of confirmed um, chronic hepatitis C cases by age, where people over 30 are in blue and people under 30 are in red. And you can see for the past you know, few years, about 30% of our chronic hepatitis C cases has been among people in their 30s. So, uh, sorry, under 30, so people in their 20s. So this is you know, a substantial problem among young people. And then now moving on to neonatal abstinence syndrome. Skir, um, you all know that, that this is when uh, you know, um, newborns are, um, uh, after delivery, after uh, they've um, uh, pregnancy of, uh, with a mother that has used opioids during pregnancy, they're born also addicted, but of course they're not getting anything, uh, and so they go through a withdrawal. That's how they begin their life, and it's really awful. So these are data from um, Catholic Health in blue and Kaleida in red, looking at the increase of neonatal abstinence syndrome emissions in, um, in, in their birthing hospitals from 2013 to 2016. You can see that there's been a substantial increase. So again, you know, these are you know, surveillance data and data extraction, so it kind of depends on the, diagnose, the diagnostic code. So um, anyway, we're going to be working with Kaleida to, to, um, to look at that. But um, you know, Catholic Health has really seen a, a large increase. So how do we respond in public health? Well, there's primary prevention, you know, preventing the problem from even happening in the first place, so preventing uh, addiction, you know, preventing drug use. Drug use. Um, secondary prevention, so people who already have the disease of addiction, you know, getting in into care so they prevent sequela. So that's getting people who are addicted. Remember, it's a disease of the brain. That's where we're all here at the Health Sciences campus because this is a disease. You know, getting them into medication-assisted treatment, like we, do, we get other people with other chronic diseases into chronic medication medication. Um, so we have to do the same thing with these individuals because it is a disease. And then tertiary prevention is using naloxone to um, prevent deaths, kind of wake people up after uh, they've overdosed. So um, to do this, we've organized an, uh, a task force. Um, to address our addiction, our um, opioid epidemic, and we have seven different work groups, and they're all kind of divided by their area of expertise. So we really, this is a huge problem, and like the health department, like we can't do it on our own. We couldn't even touch it. So we had to rely on community partners and you know law enforcement, um, affected families. Uh, you know, the, um, you know, people concerned to, to promote health education, educate our communities. Um, Dr. Updike, who's going to be speaking later, and I chair the healthcare provider and uh, uh, policy re reform and education committee. Um, we're working with the hospitals and emergency departments, and you know, getting out naloxone, where we've trained probably over 15,000 people 
so far in, um, in our area, and then our substance abuse treatment providers. And then really kind of the, the backbone of a lot of our strategies is our, our addictions hotline that is available 24-7, 831-7007, just remember James Bond. So um, just in terms of primary prevention, real quickly, um, so what you can do even before you graduate and can write any prescription or do anything, you can clean out your medicine cabinet or probably better yet clean out your parents' medicine cabinet because there are drugs in there that have been there for like ever and um, they don't need to be there because if somebody uses them it's probably not going to be for a good reason. So um, this is a list of all the uh, locations of our drug drop-off kiosks, and they always have a partner with needle and syringe kiosks, and uh, lives throughout Erie County, and it's like a mailbox, you just stick it in, and um, you know, no worries about it, and um, I, I don't know if anybody has long enough arms to reach down and, you know, collect, get, you know, whatever's in there, it's like, you know, the mailbox concept. Um, and then we contract with a, um, uh, a, uh, an agent, uh, a, um, a company that um, it t collects these and uh, the drugs and burns them so we don't all drink them in, um, you know, in our water because it's something that our, uh, you know, uh, water uh, system cannot um, remove. So we don't want to all drink those drugs. Uh, and then actually if you want to find out where a drug drop at kiosk is closest to you, you can go to this website at the point. Um, type in your zip code. So I typed in the uh, the school of nursing's, um, or type in your address. I typed in the school of nursing's address, and it'll pop up. And so that's in the the green dot is the school of nursing in the middle, and then the little yellow dots are all the drug drop off kiosks. So anybody can do that. Um, secondary prevention is again ensuring access to medication assisted treatment. People have chronic disease; they need chronic medication. So, um, you know, this was just published in JAMA a couple weeks ago that actually, you know, in um, a data um, in um, a literature review and data synthesis, it said really the bottom line is that, you know, abstinence only doesn't work. Um, doesn't work for a lot of things, but um, this, you know, addiction, opioid addiction is, a, you know, another category of health problems that it, uh, abstinence doesn't work for. And really for chronic long-term therapy, people need medication-assisted treatment. So it um, comes in several different flavors. There's uh, methadone um, and uh, buprenorphine that are very mild opioid agonists. So it's, uh, you know, it's very difficult to take enough to, um, to overdose. And methadone, it's a little easier to overdose. But again, the way it's regulated, that um, you know, it's, always, uh, it's almost always directly observed therapy. So it's, it's very highly regulated. Buprenorphine is a prescription medication that people can take in you know, the privacy of their own home. So um, and then and and uh, you know physicians who and nurse practitioners and physicians assistants who take a specific um, eight-hour training that uh, uh, Dr. Updike is going to be giving one on June 10th. That's targeting. OBGYN providers, but primary care providers are super welcome. And then um, we're having the experts from Boston Children's come on May 5th to uh, provide buprenorphine certification training for pediatric providers. Actually, I'm going to be in that class. So um, it's, you know, specific eight-hour training. Nurse practitioners and PAs need to take an additional 16 hours that we're still waiting for what that is. But again, you know, you can do it. We can all do it in this room. And then, um, and then there's naltrexone, which is an, uh, an opioid antagonist, so it's an anti-opioid. But again, there are options, and you know, people need options, and they need a, the plan has to be their plan, but it's good to have options. So this is what buprenorphine looks like. It's either you know, a pill or a sublegal film, um, and it's just a once-a-day medication. Um, so we've been very aggressive with this strategy of expanding access to medication-assisted treatment. In September, um, Paul uh, trained 33 physicians. Um, then we found out a few months later that nobody was prescribing, so um, they're, they're, you know, they were worried that you know, they needed. We did a survey to try to figure out why nobody was prescribing, because Paul's a great trainer. Um, and we uh, found that they you know, felt uncomfortable trying something new without any mentoring. And then you know, all the, they just 
felt like they didn't have the capacity in their offices to do like everything else, the counseling, the urine tox screens, you know, the follow-up for missed appointments. So um, for that, we, for both of those, we're, we are linking up uh, trained providers with uh, substance abuse treatment facilities, and so they can be mentors and they can do all that other stuff and co-manage with healthcare providers. So again, if you're a nurse practitioner in the audience or a student, because this certification is good for three years, you don't need a DA uh, license yet, but and then when you do get your DE license, then you'll have, be able to apply for the waiver. So really think about this. Um, and it's uh, the um, registrations on our website. It's free, C free CMEs and CEs from UB. It's a great opportunity. Uh, so, um, and uh, we're actually starting a pilot now for buprenorphine induction in emergency department. We know that you know people are coming in often to emergency department with health-related problems from opioid use, and so that could be a window of opportunity to be able to start them on medication-assisted treatment. Um, I'm not sure if you've, um, so, um, the Buffalo News wrote an article on some data that was uh, presented out of ECMC, Heather Lindstrom, where she looked at um, opioid-related visits at ECMC over the past few years, and she found that, like, two-thirds were actually, uh, those people were coming in seeking care. So that, that was a big missed opportunity. And then we're trying to roll out ESPERT, and so that stands for Screening Brief Intervention Referral to Treatment. So that's an evidence-based approach. It's a recommended by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force that all primary care offices do in their, in their clinic. S is screening. There are tons of validated tools out there, just a brief questionnaire just to um, explore if people are using any type of substance the BI part, beef intervention, is basically motivational interviewing. And then the RT is referral to treatment for people who need higher level care. So, um, you know, and then this is also, we re really want to pilot this in prenatal care too to try to address our neonatal abstinence syndrome. So, um, you know, the, some of the challenges with medication-assisted treatment, as I mentioned earlier, providers feel uncomfortable starting something new. But my experience is that you nurse practitioners rock and you're more willing to, you know, try something new than some of um, my medical colleagues that might have a little bit tighter anal sphincters. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so I really hope that you guys can, and our last uh, opioid, um, our last buprenorphine training in uh, a couple weeks ago, we actually had more nurse practitioners than physicians and physician's assistants who registered. So this is really a great opportunity for NPs to make a great contribution to our community. Um, you know, we also have challenges with um, the providers that physicians basically that are um, been um, prescribing buprenorphine in the community have developed kind of their own algorithms that are not evidence-based and require prolonged, their patients have prolonged detox periods before they'll initiate buprenorphine, which like nobody can do. And so that's another barrier to care that we're trying to work with. Um, as I saw, showed you that hepatitis C is, um, is a big, uh, you know, um, health sequela of injection drug use. We know that like 90% of these hepatitis C cases among people in their 20s are from injection drug use. So, um, you know, at least. So it's, uh, you know, what they're willing to, to pony up on. So, um, you know, again, um, you know, people are engaged in care, medication-assisted treatment. They can be engaged in care at hepatitis C with, um, and we could do it by telehealth, and Dr. Updike is, is, um, is creating the center of excellence where he's going to be doing this. He's, I know you might, might already be doing it, um, but he's going to be doing it. Um, and then um, we are um, also with um, the data I presented. Like we get no support from New York State to get uh, with our um, medical examiner's office. They like cut all the ME's offices dry a couple years ago. So we're all paying for all this work, and you know we need some help. So that's another challenge.